Hello friends, a very good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all our participants who have joined from different parts of the world. Welcome to this penultimate session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. This virtual conference comprising 14 thematic sessions is being co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia and CNS. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session is the 13th in the series and it is on the theme of sexual and gender-based violence and SRHR in Asia Pacific. Today also happens to be the 13th day of the 16 days of activism against sexual and other forms of gender-based violence, which are observed every year from 25th November to 10th of December. I'm also happy to share that we have two sign language interpreters with us today, Lucy Lim and John Baliza, who will guide today's session. Just a few quick housekeeping announcements for our viewers before I hand over the mic to our chairperson for today. My humble request to all the presenters to please adhere to your allotted time. There will be a prompt from the chairperson two minutes before your scheduled time is to end. Audience, please keep yourself muted and your videos turned off throughout the session. Presenters are also requested to mute themselves when not speaking. There will be a question and answer session after all the speakers have presented. Those who are using the Zoom platform can type in their comments and questions in the chat box. You can do so even as the speakers present and not wait till the end. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can type in your question in the comment box. In the interest of time, please keep your questions and comments brief and precise. Also, as we know, we are all living in challenging times and most of us are working from home. So please bear with us and bear with each other in case of any last minute technical glitches arising out of poor connectivity. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Professor Thein Thein Te. Professor Te is a former deputy health minister of Myanmar. She's an honorary professor to the University of Public Health Myanmar and University of Oslo, Norway as well as a visiting professor at Seisa University, Yokohama, Japan. She's a medical doctor by profession and specializes in public health. Professor Te was one of the founding members of the family planning program in Myanmar. She was instrumental in formulation of Myanmar reproductive health policy and several reproductive health strategic plans. She currently works as a senior public health advisor for many international organizations and is also an active board member of ICDDRB, an international health research organization located in Bangladesh. She is also executive editor of Global Journal of Medicine and Public Health. We are indeed honored to have her as our chairperson today. So over to you, Professor. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction, uh, Ms. Yoga. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, at this remarkable event, especially during the UN system, 16 days of activist, activism against gender-based violence activities. As Ms. Yoga mentioned, it's from uh, 25th November to 10th December which is taking place under our 2020 global theme, Orange the Wild, Find, Respond, Prevent, Collect. I'm truly honored to be with you in this second last virtual session of APCR SHR 10. We have our distinguished plenary speaker and esteemed abstract presenters plus one special frontliner. All speakers will bring you to walk through the session with our session theme of sexual and gender-based violence and SRHR in our region, the Asia and Pacific. You all be aware as countries implemented uh, lockdown measures to stop the spread of the 
uh, coronavirus, violence against women, especially domestic violence, becomes intensified. Even in some countries, calls to helplines have increased to fivefold. The UN Secretary General's Unite to End Violence Against Women campaign, that is a multi year effort aimed at preventing and eliminating VAW and girls. It will focus on amplifying the call for global action to bridge funding gaps, secure essential services for survivors of the violence, especially during the COVID-19 crisis, and focus on prevention and the collection of data. The Asia-Pacific region, our region presents some of the uh, very challenging development indicators for women and girls and socially excluded and marginalized populations. So we have deep rooted gender inequality and the discriminatory sociocultural norms and practices underpinning the patriarchal system and structures. So violence against women is a major concern in the region, no doubt. A key obstacle to developing evidence-based violence against women uh, and on the gender-based violence policies and programs, it is the lack of reliable and the international comparable uh, national data on this subject. Today, our session will have a wide coverage of various aspects to our theme of the sexual JBB and SRHR in the Pacific region. So thank you all once again for joining us. Without much further ado, I would like to invite our very distinguished plenary speaker, Ms. Sujata, uh, who is a technical specialist on the gender-based violence with UNRPA Asia Pacific Regional Office. She has over 14 years of very rich experiences in programming and coordination to address gender-based violence in both development and the humanitarian settings. Prior to joining the UNRPA APRO, uh, she worked in the Philippines, Pakistan, and Nepal with UNRPA and as a gender consultant for ATB. She was born and raised in Nepal, and she holds a master's degree in international relations and uh, the, from the Fletcher School of Law. She will be talking on the promising practices in addressing gender-based violence during COVID-19 context. Very interesting. Over to you, Sujata. Thank you so much. Um, if somebody could just confirm with me that you can see my slide. Yes, we can see it clearly, yes. Okay. Right. Somehow it went to the back. Okay, thank you so much and good, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as mentioned before, my name is Sujata Tunadar. I work with UN Population Fund in the Asia Pacific Regional Office um, and I support the GBB portfolio. Um, it is an absolute honor to be part of this 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Um, and thank you so much for this opportunity to present some of what we are seeing as uh, possibly promising practices in regards to addressing gender-based violence in our region. Uh, for this particular presentation, I'll be going, this is my outline. So I'll be looking at some of the strategies that we have uh, employed in terms of addressing GBB in the region, uh, in, and in particular in prevention and risk mitigation, services and innovation uh, in terms of service delivery, uh, research and data collection, collaboration and coordination, and finally, a few challenges from our end. Now, as you know, gender-based violence continues to remain pervasive in Asia Pacific region. Uh, the percentage of women and uh, women who have experienced physical and or sexual violence uh, in, the, in the last, sorry, at the hands of an intimate partner over their lifetime uh, ranges from 15 to 64%. And at the same time, 4 to 48% of women have experienced intimate partner violence in the last 12 months. And if you look at the analysis of this two set of data, what it tells us is that women in our women and women who are experiencing violence in our region are unable to find ways to make violence stop or to leave the violent relationship. But I do want to mention here that the, the data that I present here right now on this slide um, is, uh, is data that was collected prior to COVID-19 pandemic, and it's a compilation that we produce every year through our NOVA data initiative. So if anybody's interested in more information around the violence prevalence data, I do encourage you to um, visit our NOVA data initiative um, website. Now, turning, to the, turning our attention to uh, COVID-19 specifically, as we're all aware, there's been wide recognition of the heightened risk of gender-based violence um, for both women and girls in this uh, pandemic, 
and Asia Pacific does not remain any different. The COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating pre-existing gender-based violence and is likely to deepen inequalities. Several of the measures deemed necessary to control the spread of violence are not only increasing the risk of exposure to GBV for women and girls, but also limiting the GBV survivors' um, ability to distance themselves from their abusers or accessing uh, life-saving GBV services. So given this context and building on UNFPA's long-standing experience in GBB prevention and response in both the development and humanitarian settings, here are some of the strategies that we have been working on to improve the support to survivors um, to, of gender-based violence. So first of all, strengthening systems, building on existing established systems of partnerships and collaborations for delivery of essential and life-saving GBB response continues to remain our key priority. Secondly, strengthening capacities of frontline service providers, governments, and partners to adapt their GBV response services in the restricted context of COVID-19 is another area of investment. We've also been continuing our advocacy with government and partners to ensure that GBV services are classified as essential and life-saving services in the context of COVID. This also means continued investment and funding to make GBV response services accessible and available. Through our NOVA data initiative, we've also been providing guidance on collecting uh, GBV-related data in COVID-19 context with safe and ethical methodologies that does not compromise women's safety. And finally, uh, using our UNFPA's um, you know, global mandate as the lead of GBB coordination mechanisms and emergencies, we are also working to ensure that adequate coordination and collaboration is fostered while we are documenting some of these promising practices, some of which I'm hoping to present today. Now let's dive into some of the key areas of intervention. In the area of prevention and risk mitigation, um, while many of the evidence-based strategies uh, that have been proven effective in prevention of violence against women are difficult to operationalize in the context of COVID, we are seeing some adaptations that are promising. In particular, community engagement and mobilization programs, which are really hard to implement with restrictions on movement, are now being adapted to digital movement. So for example, in the region, we are seeing strong partnerships with media and use of a variety of digital tools such as community-based radios, uh, televisions where accessible, uh, social media, um, and even SMS text messages to raise visibility of violence against women, challenge the stereotypes, and share information about existing services. Now you can see here a screenshot of um, a GBV uh, services video um, in Philippines on the uh, on the top right of the slide here, and this is available on social media widely. Uh, where, where these are not possible, uh, countries are adapting to spreading the messages through loudspeakers or in moving vehicles. We're also seeing these GVV messages uh, being included in emergency cards that are being provided to communities with a variety of COVID-related um, information. And you've seen an example here at the bottom of the slide uh, from the Pacific. We're also seeing dedicated attention to quarantine sites where several targeted interventions are being designed to share information to the quarantine site residents on GVV services. In some areas, we're seeing early examples of digital delivery of life skills and comprehensive sexuality education curriculum that challenge harmful gender norms. Now, it's too early to say whether these are going to be as effective as in normal times, but it's still promising to see these uh, approaches. In a few other contexts, partnerships with you know, faith-based leaders, community leaders are also being explored to challenge these harmful gender norms and promote more equitable norms during COVID-19. If we now move to um, you know, GBB response, we're seeing lots of adaptation of global guidelines uh, to Asia Pacific regional context. And at national level, several examples of innovation um, are emerging. I will attempt to highlight some of them, but I do have to say in the outset that it will not be possible to capture all of them in the short time. So an example uh, of uh, adaptation of counseling services, which have really emerged as a key essential service during COVID-19, we've seen examples in Pakistan, Mongolia, Indonesia, and a few other countries where telecounseling modalities have become very commonplace. 
in Nepal, trained community-based psychosocial workers who've been the first-time responders um, for years have now been equipped with cell phone credits so they can continue to reach out to uh, and respond to women at risk in their communities telephonically. A few countries are also exploring the concept of creative shelters through partnerships with Airbnb, hotels, or university dorms that can make room avail rooms available for GDP survivors in a safe way. In several countries, we're also seeing innovation in terms of mobile safety apps and other online resources that connect survivors of service providers. Um, and some applications are also providing you know, safety planning options for women when they're able to safely leave the situation of, of abuse. You'll see here an example at the bottom, which says Her Voice, which is a uh, mobile app that was recently launched in the Philippines. We also see support being channeled to women in quarantine centers uh, as another way of accessing those in need. In many countries, uh, dignity kits, which um, can include basic survival materials, um, as well as GBV service information, are being distributed and some are being adapted to specific needs of women with disabilities or women, uh, elderly women, transgendered women in various contexts in our region. We're also seeing stronger partnerships with community-based health workers like midwives, female health workers who are being further supported to safely identify cases of GBV, provide first-line support and facilitate referrals. A case in point is um, in Cox's Bazaar, where in women-friendly spaces, we see uh, midwives sitting and providing some of this support. And that has allowed for the women-friendly spaces to remain open even with COVID-related uh, restrictions. With many of the capacity building initiatives um, having moved to virtual, um, it has been quite a realization that this modality can work even for very specific GBV related areas like case management and training for hotline operators, et cetera. And we are realizing that with this modality, uh, we are able to reach more participants in further off areas and make these trainings available for no cost, uh, hence bridging any financial or geographical barriers that we have had in the past. Now, the effectiveness of these virtual modalities of cap capacity building are need to be evaluated, um, but at the same time, we are encouraged to see these promising practices. Um, another area which uh, we're seeing a movement in, in the region is really to showcase the lived stories and realities of frontline GBV service providers. Here you see an example, a range of examples of such stories being showcased in, uh, in different formats and the social media. Um, I find this really encouraging because, you know, we are continuing to live in this reality for a while and it's, we, we do need to understand and, uh, and learn from the frontline service providers in terms of what has enabled them to continue this work, as well as how we can sustain such support services. And in the area of GBV data and research, several countries in the region are collecting data on GBV services, uh, which has enabled them to, um, to expand or update the referral mechanism so that that becomes much more uh, accessible and reliable for GBV service providers as well as for, for, for GBV survivors, and also to identify gaps in terms of uh, GBV service programs. Given that there's a huge demand for GBV data and need for evidence, um, but also some risk in terms of collecting data, which does not always uh, keep in mind women's safety, UNFA, UN Women and WHO have come up with um, uh, this decision tree that you can see at the bottom of the slide, which really walks you through and highlights how you can collect GBV data without compromising women's safety. I encourage you to take a look at this on our website. And then finally, in the area of collaboration and coordination, we have seen a global push to strengthen this area. Recently, the Secretary General of the UN has launched a new strategy on GBV and COVID-19, and that has already seen uh, quite effect, being quite effective in garnering government, UN, civil society collaboration with one voice to ensure that funding for GBV is increased, response and prevention mechanisms are strengthened, and data collection is conducted with the highest level of ethics and safety. We are seeing tremendous collaboration um, in designing and delivering GBV response services and development of these referral guidelines. And you'll see an example from Fiji down below where government, civil society, and UN have come together with their information to create this. 
uh, we've also seen quite a bit of collaboration in terms of how we how we responsibly represent and re uh, report on violence against women and violence against children. And you'll see a guideline that has been developed uh, recently on this. And a huge amount of collaboration in the areas of mental health and psychosocial support through coming together of, um, of uh, practitioners, government um, and uh, investors to ensure that the, in, the services are available and accessible. Now, having said all of this, uh, we are still in the midst of the pandemic and several challenges remain. In, the con in, the, in most contexts, uh, GBV service uh, response services are still not considered as part of essential COVID response. So advocacy and partnership around this is still needed. We're still not seeing the level of investment and funding that is needed to, the, to, needed to address the issue and the magnitude of the issue. Uh, remote delivery of GBV services is continuing to be a challenge. We need to prioritize continue, continued capacity building and adaptation of tools and guidelines, including support to frontline service providers who are um, already overwhelmed and under-resourced. We do anticipate that um, you know, with the lockdown measures easing, survivors may seek to access GBV services at an increased level or at, uh, you know, in context where the lockdowns extend or initiated for the second wave, GBV risk will be exacerbated. We're also seeing new forms of violence and new means of perpetrating violence, which means we need to evolve in the, the way we provide services. We're also seeing the need to evolve the methodologies for GDB data collection that reflects the challenges um, of COVID-related uh, restrictions. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, that the investment in adapting evidence-based approaches to GDB prevention and social norm change in COVID-19 context is essential. And while we talk about all these you know, potentially promising practices, how do we sustain them? Because COVID-19 continues to remain a challenge for a while, that remains another, another concern. Overall, there is a looming challenge that the progress made in the region in addressing gender-based violence over the last several years may be compromised and face potential backlash. And finally, having said this, I do still believe that the COVID-19 pandemic provides us an opportunity to further evolve and innovate our strategies and approaches to ensure long-term transformative changes to ending violence against women. It is really up to us right now to come together and put all our best energies together in this regard. GVV is probably going to outlive the pandemic, so we hope we have learned enough and innovated enough that we're able to prevent any long-term impacts on gender equality and women's empowerment after the pandemic goes. Thank you so much. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much, Sujata, for keeping up the time and uh, for your very insightful speech on addressing GBB uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in the region. You give us uh, the future thoughts on the promising practices and challenges to be tackled. You have open up an important chapter on the pre-existing JVV harmful practices and defense inequality to look into by all of us. Thank you. It is also very thankful to share with us the measures for the prevention and risk mitigation initiatives. A very, uh, very good information to the, all the countries in the region. I'm very happy to see the Nima Vajan pamphlet uh, as a psychosocial aspect uh, due to JBB. The collaboration on the mental health and the psychosocial working group is a really noteworthy among others, as this important piece of JBB services are usually uh, left out in the initial period in many of times. So thank you once again, Sujata, for your great speech. Now, uh, let me introduce to our first abstract presenter, uh, Mr. Sovedari who is the research manager at Kana Cambodia that supports community ownership and empowerment, where all people have equitable access to quality HIV and health services and uh, sustainable development opportunities. His role as research manager is to design, replicate, and guide the program innovations and implementations. And he currently works in close collaboration with the National Center for HIV AIDS Dermatology and STD, National Authority for Combating Drugs, National Center for Tuberculosis and Leprosy, National Institute of Public Health, and University of Health Science to manage 
lead and implement the national large scale studies. He also holds a key role in TB program as program director, leading program operations in all areas of management and technical program. Uh, he will be presenting as the gender-based violence experience and sexual and reproductive health among female entertainment workers in Cambodia, a cross-sectional study. The floor is yours, Mr. Suvenry. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Professor uh, the Chair. So, so uh, may I share my, my screen? Okay. Can you can you see this the, the screen share? Yes, we yes yes we can. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Swanri Tur from Kanas, Cambodia. It is my great honor to present our research title, Gender-based violence experience and such all and reproductive health among female entertainment workers in Cambodia across such no, uh, studies. So first let's move to the background of the studies. Female entertainment workers. FEWR considers a key population with a high prevalence of HIV infection and at such early transmitted infections. The prevalence of HIV in the latest survey was 3.2%. Besides, female internal workers confront with various health and occupational hazards, including poor sexual reproductive health and exposure to HIV, sexual and reproductive health risk and violence. Violence against women has been found to have decremental impact on physical, sexual, and mental health, leading to high morbidities and mortalities rate in other cities. Given the nature of their work and their marginalized and stigmatized position in societies, FEW might encounter intimate partners' violence in their private life and GBV from clans and others. It hypothesis that clan portrait the GBP take different form than intimate partners violence. Data on GBP experience of women working in the sex and that's one of these are globally scans. So uh, therefore the objective of the study aim to examine the prevalence of differences uh, type of GBPs among FEW in Cambodia according to type of perpetrators and identify factors associated with their victimization. We obtained data from cross-sectional uh, surveys where a 300 uh, FEW were surveyed. The collected data was part of the, the midterm evaluation of the mobile project conducting in late uh, 2018. Uh, just to let you brief out the mobile project is the multi site single blind uh, randomized control trials project with two arms of 300 FEW each. The present of this study did not differ between the two groups and we used the total of samples uh, recruited. The selected study size uh, were the municipality of Phnom Penh, uh, Bat Nabal, Bat Dimitri, and Simbrius provinces, where the HIV prevalence are larger. Proportion of female intertum workers uh, reported to be high. A certified random sampling were used to recruit the selected participants from the entertainment venues. Face-to-face -face interviews was conducted using tablet-based. Stata version 13 uh, was used to analyze the data and we include two. A bivariate analysis was used to compare the type of uh, GBV per traders and the multi logistic regression analysis was used to see the factor associated with the uh, sexual harassment and type of 
this study was approved by the, the National Ethics Committee for Health Research and uh, Ministry of Health Cambodia. Let's see the first uh, uh, result of the uh, GBV experiment and, and sexual harassment among female uh, FEW. As you can see the, uh, the, uh, the result here. As you can see the result here. The intimate partner violence considered mostly at of emotional abuse. You can see experiment of emo. The 60 point six, about 60 percent, about 60 percent, about 60 percent uh, uh, or two, uh, about two thirds of the participants has put in the GBV in their lifetime. Of whom you can see 37.5 percent has put in at in the past uh, six months. The experience includes the emotional abuse and the, the main perpetrator of violence in the past season was from the clients up to uh, 52%. And also you can see the, the one who experienced with the sexual harassment of 80% is burdened with sexual uh, harassment in the past six months. Looking at the uh, uh, association in terms of GBV experience and the partners, entire partners, we include intimate partners, clan, and others in the past six months. So the other here, including the uh, owner manager of the establishment. And the, the table show that the 66%, you can see the six, six, 66, 65 percent, almost 65 percent, you know, uh, uh, experience with the uh, emotional abuse by the intimate partner. And the others uh, uh, are followed by the physical abuse and the uh, force uh, uh, abuse, uh, uh, substance ab uh, uh, use uh, by the client. So you can see the trend of differences. Looking at the different, the comparison, you can look at the comparisons uh, with uh, women violated by intimate partner and other women who has victimized by client has significant experience more force. You can see the uh, more force, uh, substance use for the persons and comparing to the others, uh, eight percent, you can see this. That study here is the number that uh, seems can differences by using the uh, uh, surgical test. And looking at the uh, multi regression uh, analysis, we put some uh, key variable uh, into the log to the to the model, and we can see from the uh, uh, table that. Uh, you can see the difference in asterisk here. It's about the women who, you know, uh, uh, after associated with sexual harassment, it's likely happen. It's about almost two times, uh, uh, one point, you know, point time uh, acceptance of violence, and the uh, almost one point six time uh, happen at the uh, uh, restaurant cafe, and uh, almost. Uh, 2.4 uh, time happened at the big gardens. In terms of looking at the uh, factor associated with the violence and uh, and clients, and either compared to the uh, uh, intimate partners in the past six months, you can see the only one that can uh, present in this side here is about the, the only the merits happen among the merits uh, 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 clients, which uh, Zero point more than the uh, the other partners. So, so, so that the point that we had to take into consideration when we turn into the pro program, uh, uh, the uh, uh, program uh, developments and uh, designs. So, it come to my uh, uh, conclusion that uh, uh, women uh, in this study the FEW in Cambodia is put in high level and unique from our GBV as you can see from the previous uh, slide in terms of you know, 
different uh, uh, experience in from different perspective, including the intimate partners, clients, and also the uh, the others, uh, including managers and the uh, uh, venue uh, uh, owners. And the the findings suggest that the interventions uh, need to be uh, tailored to fit the specific needs and experience of uh, female intelligent workers. And also the intervention should be aimed at the using of the client related uh, violence should specifically fo focus on for substance use and forces, while physical abuse by intimate partners should also be addressed among women who are married or living with partners. That the last uh, presentation, the last uh, slide can present you only the one who is in the, uh, living together or with partner or marriage and uh, facing with and uh, last but not least, uh, research, more research should be uh, conducted to identify the factor associated with these uh, different type of victimization. So this will be a uh, uh, thing for further study. So uh, uh, with all that, I would like to thank uh, the study participants and the free researcher and HIPT community who support our works and special thanks to our uh, supporters, collaborators and the the funders, as well as the, the author of the book. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take uh, your uh, questions. Thank you so much for your really interesting presentation, Mr. Sobeni. Uh, it explores the pre prevalence of different type of the JBB among female entertainment workers in Cambodia, according to the types of perpetrators and identifying factors associated with their victimization are also identified. It also calls for the uh, very important tailored interventions to fit the specific needs of the uh, FEWs as well as the spouses of HIV affected partners. Very important message with similar importance to focus on post substance use and then post sex is suggested very uh, I can valuable advice indeed. Thank you so much. Then now uh, moving to the next agenda, I'm pleased to invite the second abstract presenter, Dr. Milania, uh, who leads a reproductive health program of the UNMP office, uh, country office in Indonesia. As a national program officer on RH, she oversees UNMP uh, country programming Sorry, uh, some interruption. And the country programming and the technical assistance for RH related issues. Her current work focuses on strengthening the family planning uh, components under the universal head coverage scheme, strengthening of midwifery workforce for improvement of quality of care, and promoting global commitments for maternal and newborn health. She leads the UNFPA Reproductive Health Unit to collaborate with Ministry of Health and National Board for Population and Family. She will be presenting on the rapid assessment of gender-based violence during the emergency situation in Palu, Siki, and at Dongala, Central Sulawesi. The floor is yours, Dr. Mila. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me share my screen and then... Yeah. Please confirm if you have seen my screen. Yes. Yes. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks again, Madam Chair. And uh, let me greet all the panelists here, Madam Moderator, and all the audience uh, attending this session. A very good afternoon or good morning or good evening to all of you. It is my great pleasure, really, uh, to join this virtual event and share uh, some of our papers, in particular on this uh, GBP in crisis situation. Um, despite this uh, virtual conference, I, I see that uh, the series of uh, sessions, conference is uh, well organized and has presented uh, interesting topics, highlighted uh, important discussion. And um, let me appreciate a uh, very highly appreciation to the organizer and the community. And I hope our session today will also uh, generate some uh, rich uh, discussion. So uh, my presentation is uh, about GBP in humanitarian setting, and I will present findings, key findings from the GBP rapid assessment 
that UNFPA Indonesia conducted um, between November 2018 uh, to January 2019 in the aftermath of the earthquake in Central Sulawesi. A little background on the on the disaster. Um, uh, the earthquake hit uh, three districts in uh, Central Sulawesi on September 28 in 2018 and uh, followed by a landslide that uh, later we call uh, the li liquefaction. That's uh, another type of uh, natural disaster that we have never uh, experienced in, our, in my life here, in many of our lives here in, in the country. And just to give you a, a geographic sense of location, if you look at the, the red box, it's where um, uh, the districts are located. It's uh, Palu, Donggala, and Sigli. Uh, it's located in, in uh, Central Sulawesi, the Celebes. And um, it claimed uh, around 3,000, more than 3,000 uh, lives with around 700 still missing. It caused extensive damage in three districts and affected around 170,000 people to lose their houses who were then uh, being displaced in many settlements. So, um, sorry. So uh, the uh, global evidence uh, shows that uh, G GBV cases are escalated during, during the crisis and uh, disaster and various humanitarian crises often disrupt the procurement of basic needs, public services, safety mechanism and protection. And this is often overlooked. So UNFPA Indonesia conducted a GBP rapid assessment in, uh, in Central Sulawesi in the, the three districts to identify potential risk of GBP among the affected population, the forms of GBP, the reaction uh, or responses of the survivors and her surroundings, including the families. It also identifies uh, existing services uh, and support for GBP cases. And um, after we produced the report, we were also able to use the report and uh, brought it to the policy table. We discussed the findings with the key stakeholders and decision makers and uh, improve the national, both national and regional uh, mechanism to prevent GBP uh, during emergency uh, response cases. Uh, the assessment was jointly conducted by UNFP Indonesia with the Department of uh, Women's Empowerment and Child Protection of uh, Central Sulawesi government, provincial government, a local NGO for women's equality, the KPKPST, it's a mark for uh, appreciation, and also uh, the Learning Circle for Women, uh, the Libu Foundation. The assessment used qualitative design using FGDs, and also we use uh, application, uh, we call uh, uh, the Kobo Collect application for individual uh, survey, individual questionnaire. And we also conducted an in-depth interview with uh, some key informants. Uh, samples were purposefully selected among men and women from the three uh, affected districts, uh, aged between uh, uh, 18 to 68 years old. And the study covers 304 uh, respondents that were interviewed using the Kobo Collect application. Uh, 33 informants with the uh, in-depth interviews and uh, eight F FGDs among uh, adults, men and women, uh, 120 uh, women and men uh, joined F eight FGDs and around uh, 85 uh, adolescents, girls and boys uh, in five uh, FGDs. So before uh, I share the key findings, uh, let me highlight some notes uh, from the process. Um, we, we were fully aware that uh, GBP is not well uh, apprehended or well understood by many communities in Indonesia, by many of the Indonesian people. Societies accept some forms of GBP as normal uh, practices. Therefore, uh, therefore, there is a, a tendency for uh, underreporting. So with this understanding, we try to design the questions 
to as much as possible fully capture uh, the experiences by listing all the possible uh, GBP practices uh, in the questionnaire. So we don't, uh, we avoid the, uh, the uh, open, open, um, open question. Yeah? So uh, we list down all the uh, GBP, uh, possible GBP practices. And uh, when it's about rape or rape attempt, uh, it's even more sensitive. People or even the victims or survivors do not discuss this openly. So the use of uh, Kobo Collect application and uh, followed by the in-depth interviews that, uh, with key informants has helped to dig deeper into various information or stories that were very likely to be uh, underreported. Um, uh, let me now share with some of the key findings. Uh, as you can see in the slide, this slide shows a number of cases reported during the assessment. So during our assessments through the Kobo Collect and through the uh, uh, interview, we recorded uh, 57 uh, cases of uh, GBP uh, with different uh, forms of GBP. And uh, the assessment also confirmed the, the, uh, confirms the vulnerabilities of uh, times, locations, and places, women's or girls' situation, and the community perception uh, towards GBP. As you may see in the slides, uh, uh, these are the points that put the women and girls at a greater risk of GBP in the in the in the study location in in the TEM in uh, uh, IDP scan. So um, unsafe locations, like uh, we can already uh, predict, it's where uh, people uh, get the water, the toilet, the latrine facilities the dark and quiet uh, footpath or uh, road uh, and uh, uh, quiet areas around the camp. And also uh, there is a higher risk of women who, who live to, uh, by themselves, um, uh, women household heads or widows uh, or single women without uh, families or they are uh, in, in more uh, in the greater risk uh, as well. Uh, the assessment recorded almost all types of uh, GBP, as you can see uh, in this slide. So from domestic violence, be it physical uh, violence, yeah, beating, or, or uh, also uh, verbal abuse, rape, attempt uh, rape, multiple gang rape, harassment, sexual exploitation, child marriage, forced marriage, and uh, female circumcision. Uh, they are all... Uh, uh, they all happened in, in, in the three uh, uh, district or in the 10 uh, camp uh, location. The survivors were uh, from as young as nine years old girl to 50 uh, years woman. And sorry. And the perpetrators were mostly those who they know, uh, neighbors, uh, uncles, fathers, um, grandfathers, uh, com even community leaders, and, and uh, although there were some uh, also cases by uh, unknown uh, men and boys. Uh, after, so uh, when we um, analyzed the response uh, from the survivors, uh, after experiencing GBV, the reaction of both the girls and adult women in general is to re remain silent. Women who have suffered rape feel uh, taboo to report. They are afraid of being embarrassed by community members, afraid of losing respect, and accused of having bad uh, behavior, which in turn uh, will make them uh, um, fear of losing the chance to get a, a husband. Adolescent girls who become pregnant after being raped um, tend to uh, get an abortion oftentimes using unsafe ways to cover up uh, their pregnancy. Uh, from the FGD, we found uh, two cases of uh, adolescent girls who died uh, due to unsafe abortion. And uh, for those who survived after the abor abortion, they were also vulnerable to human trafficking, trafficking uh, or prostitu prostitution. Uh, some of the survivor uh, 
uh, told uh, us that uh, they ran away uh, from from house from home uh, for for a while, and others um, um, choose to remain silent because, uh, like I said earlier, they are afraid to tell about the incident due to trauma or fear of being blamed and labeled negatively by the community members. Young adult respondents choose not to discuss the rape incident for they were afraid of being beaten or uh, persecuted by family members and being forced to marry the perpetrators. Survivors uh, often experience uh, secondary abuse, um, uh, physical and verbal abuse uh, from the family or from the community, rejection, stigma, bad labeling and isolation, not only by the community, but also from their uh, family as a punishment for uh, ruining, ruining their family uh, honor. And uh, they are also often uh, be blamed for bad behavior, uh, you know, uh, so people, uh, community and family uh, tend to blame them for, for, for the, the uh, GBP that they receive uh, because uh, they said that it's because your bad behavior that people uh, are uh, doing that to you. So um, uh, that's why many men and uh, girls are not uh, encouraged uh, to report or to discuss. There were also, um, we also found that uh, many of the respondents uh, considered some of the GBV practice as normal uh, or harmless. Those uh, are uh, among other, uh, you know, sexually suggestive comments or sexually uh, jokes, or they don't see it as the, as the uh, GBV uh, uh, practice. Uh, uh, for the community response, um, the, the response on GBV cases uh, uh, from the community were uh, mainly uh, on how to save uh, family honor. Uh, on domestic violence, for example, um, what uh, general response from the community is uh, we'll try to mediate uh, or reconciliate between um, the husband or wife, for example, or daughter and family. And most, most of the case, um, the community will take side on, on the perpetrators, on the men, uh, especially uh, husband, father, or, or men, uh, member, uh, family members. Um, customary mechanism is common procedure for uh, resolving GBV, especially in indigenous community, where the perpetrator is caught or whose uh, identity is known will be brought before the head of the customary community to get punished, to get the punishment. Um, and uh, most of the punishment will be physical, like uh, beaten, um, getting uh, get beaten by the, by the uh, community leader. Um, and and um, this is, as you see in the, in the slide, um, uh, some of the main of uh, the main response from the community is uh, reconciliation by uh, paying some fines uh, from the perpetrators to the family, or uh, get them married uh, to keep the family honor. And this is why uh, many of the women or girls don't want to uh, report or discuss uh, the GBV or uh, in particular the rape, yeah, because uh, they they don't want to to be married to, to the perpetrator. The assessment also recorded 14% uh, uh, of the women respondents experienced uh, domestic violence. Most cases were uh, physical and uh, verbally abused. And uh, there were also some uh, cases where wives or daughters were being kicked out from the house, from the family. They, uh, they sent out from the house, they, they, they are not uh, accepted uh, to the family anymore. They were uh, crossed out from the family member. Some, okay. Some also experienced illegal polygamy practice. And uh, there were uh, common perceptions among the women that we are uh, our husband's property and they have paid the dowry so husband can do anything to their wives. On child marriage or forced marriage, uh, it's also a prevalent. And um, uh, you see the blue, the blue uh, text here. Uh, it's a common, uh, common uh, perceive of uh, among the community that when 
when girls reach 10 to 12 years old, or if they have started their period, and it's time for the father to find a husband for the, for the daughters. Uh, FGM also prevalent. Uh, almost all uh, the female girls respondent experience FGM type one. Uh, practice is uh, when they are they were newborn or five years old. Basically, uh, based on tradition and uh, religions. Sexual exploitation happens in the camps, although people do not talk about it. Some did for an exchange of money, exchange of money, food or goods. Uh, some perpetrators were those who were in, cha in charge on food or assistance uh, distribution. Uh, on GBV support and care, there are existing support and care, although uh, because of the disaster, the existing support were, were not functioning. And we also recorded uh, two local wisdom, uh, uh, they call it Rogo and Laurel Lindu, uh, on how uh, the, the local community has established um, community-based uh, care for vulnerable women or customary uh, rules uh, uh, to, uh, or sanction uh, for violation of, uh, of uh, uh, gender-based violence. Uh, we can discuss the, uh, this later if, if, uh, if we have time later. Um, so as a conclusion, um, the, the report uh, concluded that GBV is present and needs to be escalated. Um, but, but GBV prevention and GBV man management not yet put as, as a priority. Even humanitarian workers, program managers, or service pro providers do not see GBV prevention and management as a priority and in humanitarian response. Community awareness and understanding uh, is also low. Uh, they tend uh, to put the survivor in another risk uh, of uh, violence. A safety audit needs to be implemented in any crisis situation, followed by awareness creation and establishment of reporting and case management uh, mechanism. Uh, there are six recommendations that uh, we put in the in in the report. Um, uh, among others, um, to put uh, to put a safety audit to uh, put in place safety audit to organize GBV public awareness, to involve women in the AIDS assistance and good distribution, and establish women's friendly space immediately in, uh, after a, a, a disaster, and also to uh, identify existing good practices that protects women or girls uh, from GBV. Uh, our last recommendation is uh, to involve uh, men and boys uh, in uh, norms reconstruction, and in any uh, initiative uh, to prevent or uh, GBV in the humanitarian setting. I stop here and uh, thank you for uh, listening to my presentation and I return the mic the, to Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mila. Thank you for your very informative presentation. We are given an overview of the needs of vulnerable women, girls, and people with disabilities in the IDB settlements, various aspects of JBB are identified, including the impacts, victims, response, and environmental reactions, among others. The study also pointed out the level of awareness that needs to be improved among community and even among humanitarian workers, program managers, and service providers. Very important message. This is a call for a safety audit reporting and case management in any crisis situation. Thank you, Dr. Mila, again. Now let us move to the next agenda. I would like to invite Mr. Saka, who is a program coordinator at the YP Foundation and works on the building models of the public engagement with the young people on masculinities. And then he studied sociology at the Embedkar University Delhi. Prior to joining TYPF, uh, Mr. Saka has had uh, experience of working on masculinities and then gender justice with young men from low-income communities in Delhi. Has also worked on the uh, and and oral history projects at the center. So he will be presenting with the title of the Re-Evaluating Masculinities for SRH and then JBB programming. Over to you, Mr. Saga. Hello, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes. All right. 
Hi, I'm Sagar. Uh, very happy to be here. And uh, thanks to the organizers to uh, make this happen, at least online. Uh, so in my presentation today, I will be talking about uh, reevaluating masculinities for SRH and uh, GBV programming. Um, so uh, in this presentation, what I will be doing is that I'll be talking about a research that was conducted by uh, the YP Foundation over 2018 and 19 uh, with young men uh, in one location and uh, what were the key findings from this research as well as uh, what are the gaps in programming uh, that the research was able to identify and what recommendations for programming it made eventually and I'll just a little bit at the end about how we are also uh, thinking of framing research a continuous form of research in the COVID context and adding to whatever I'm going to present. Uh, so, uh, hoping that uh, my presentation is visible, uh, I so what this research uh, was trying to uh, to investigate was the intersections of gender, sexuality, caste, class, religion in discussions of masculinities, and this is in the context that a lot of uh, masculinities programs, uh, especially with young men and boys, focus on the aspects of gender and sexuality. Uh, to talk about patriarchy and masculinities, but oftentimes uh, we see that caste, class, and religion, and many other identity positions uh, do not come to the front as much as gender, and along with gender, uh, then uh, and also in this research, we try to uh, understand the impact of social media on uh, young men's experiences of masculinities, and how uh, all of these things uh, impact their relationships, their friendships, uh, love, marriage, infidelity, and how men navigate all these spaces uh, uh, in the context of these identities. Uh, and thereof, uh, obviously, understanding with their perceptions around consent, sexual health, uh, contraception, and the violence that takes place. So with these objectives in mind, uh, this research was conducted in three cities called Lucknow, Banaras, and Aligarh in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh in India. And uh, uh, through the method of purposive snowball sampling, we, uh, the FGTs were con uh, conducted with 80 young men and out of which a smaller group was uh, in the age group of 18 to 20 years. And these were uh, primarily college going men, uh, working class men, and uh, from multiple caste and religious backgrounds and from and, and some of the respondents were also from the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, and all these men, uh, as a note, were also identified as cis men in this research. Um, so I, there are uh, multiple thematics that emerged from this research. What I will do, I will try to do is go over these quite briefly uh, for the sake of time also. And maybe if there are questions around something specific, we can so uh, uh, in terms of uh, understanding gender norms, uh, the research found that there are many uh, uh, ways and axes around which uh, norms and hierarchies are created amongst uh, men themselves. So within peer networks of men, uh, different kinds of standards and different kinds of hierarchies are set based on uh, masculine self images. So uh, having to live up to certain standards and certain uh, performances brings somebody up that hierarchy and failing to do so puts, pushes somebody down that hierarchy and leads to also a sense of alienation and selfhood uh, and uh, and, and these are there are many sites at which this gets played. So the color of the skin uh, amongst men, or the color of the skin of their partners that they might be uh, uh, romantically involved with or uh, dating at the time, brings certain kind of a masculine status to them within this kind of norm building. Uh, similarly, uh, in terms of different identities, also caste came out as a very uh, major informant to masculine experiences of men. So the location where we were, uh, 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 we are talking about right now, uh, caste, um, uh, caste hierarchies exist very visibly and inform people's experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So some examples of this would be, say, uh, for instance, upper caste men uh, would face a certain expectation of doing violence. So. Uh, not just and apart from you know a, a way to talk a way to walk and uh how much you eat is also about 
of somebody's caste status, but uh, also in in situations of confrontation, an upper caste man may be uh, expected to respond in a more violent way, uh, while certain caste positions, uh, people from uh, men from the lower caste, might be expected to. Uh, perform a more subservient role in terms of conflict. So these kind of expectations also inform what kind of manhood uh, somebody is supposed to be or somebody is allowed to be uh, performing in their daily lives and in different spaces. And this kind of uh, performance and expression takes place in many different spaces. Um, so the way spaces get organized are also uh, categorized into masculine and feminine. So household is generally, while household is generally categorized as a more feminine space, uh, within the household also there are many different, uh, uh, many different uh, categorizations that happen as masculine and feminine. So within the household, uh, one would think that the kitchen is more feminine and there are other spaces which are more occupied by men for, uh, and, and their activities then considered masculine. So that kind of division also exists. and within this kind of socialization, certain policing within houses, within schools also exist to make sure that uh, this kind of uh, uh, norm is being maintained at every stage. Uh, moving on, uh, similar to how caste has been informing uh, men's experiences, religion and nationalism come together into a mix to impact men's uh, experiences in a certain way. So uh, assertion of religious masculine identity uh, would require a certain uh, othering of another religious identity. So identifying one's own religion as say, uh, for, as an example, less violent to women as against some other religion and the men from other religion might be one way to establish uh, one's own masculine identity as higher than the other. So, uh, and in the context of nationalism also, we see uh, specifically in India over the last many years, that uh, uh, there is a perception of the Muslim minority population being uh, be, uh, being violent, being uh, against the nation. And uh, there's also this stereotype of uh, Muslim men being terrorists. So uh, that kind of uh, narrative started coming up in this research and how a certain religious community is seen as a threat to the nation. So that kind of then in response to that, a certain kind of masculinity and a certain kind of identity assertion needs to happen. So. Uh, uh, religion and nationalism along, mixed with caste inform these experiences very heavily. In terms of sexual identity, also uh, uh, men face a very uh, heteronormative socialization. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, while the conversation around gender is stuck in binaries, uh, language which uses trans identities as an abuse to others is also very common amongst men. So. Uh, this kind of uh, unpacking and this will become a little relevant later in the presentation when we talk about programming, but uh, considering uh, uh, people from the LGBTQI community uh, as lower on the masculine hierarchy among the cis uh, heterosexual uh, men is a very common practice. Moving on, uh, friendships were seen as a site, a very uh, important site of uh, care and uh, support building among men. So while a lot of those standards of masculinity, a lot of norms around masculinity are sent among peer networks, uh, these are also networks where support and resources for following these kinds of norms is also provided. And, it was, and, and this is very relevant for uh, programming later that uh, these are the sites where conversations can happen because there's more agency in choosing friends uh, there are more solidarities and care networks uh, that are built within this and this is also a space and these again are also informed by uh, caste and religious identities in terms of what, who my friend is. Uh, in romantic relationships also uh, a lot of men see uh, romantic relationships as uh, just a way to pass time or something of a waste of time also uh, because uh, it's there's a lot of pressure around uh, uh, quote unquote, taking a girlfriend out, uh, forming a certain kind of a, uh, an image of masculinity for that, and uh, also facing a lot of uh, what is known as betrayal. And this came out as a very uh, major and very common pattern amongst men is to feel the sense of betrayal, which when on further probing was found to be 
basically uh, the absence or taking away of consent. So whenever uh, 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 whenever a, a woman or a young girl uh, exercises agency in terms of ending a relationship or uh, saying no to a man, that is seen as betrayal or uh, how it's called dhoka in Hindi, and death, which then leads to violence. Uh, so, and in marriages also in between romantic relation and marriage, the perception of the wife and the girlfriend came out very differently. So immunity in marriage is much higher among men. Uh, the, the image of the girlfriend would be around standards of certain ideals of beauty, certain uh, status building through how attractive uh, somebody's girlfriend is. But amongst men, that's how the valuation happens and that's how the status building happens. But amongst, uh, but in, for marriage, men were uh, mostly expressed how the wife needs to do the household work, take care of the children, take care of the family, and along those lines. So there are different expectations that uh, amongst men networks that have been built. In sexual, uh, and yeah, so around sexual practices and safe sex, uh, lots of thematics around virility came up, uh, how men are consuming uh, different ideas of uh, sexual practices, to, uh, how do they access porn through uh, peers and older uh, men or some cousin or some seniors in school, uh, the economies of uh, different kinds of uh, uh, videos that and the shops that provide these things and the magazines that are provided. So there are these networks that men uh, have to access all these things. And in, in terms of safe sex, uh, safety in sex is generally actually seen as uh, nobody finding out and not getting caught because mm -hmm. that there is a certain taboo to indulging in sexual relations. Um, so that's where the definition of safety came out in this research. Uh, and condoms being the primary mode of contraception that most people were aware of. Uh, so going back to the point of violence was that uh, consent uh, is uh, understood in ways that are a little problematic in the sense that uh, uh, understanding a no as betrayal uh, leads to, uh, instead of understanding consent, it becomes a, a gateway to violence where a lot of times that kind of not being able to deal with that kind of rejection leads to many different forms of violence and a lot of instances of uh, acid attacks were also mentioned by the young men respondents. Uh, social media is also used for a lot of image building again around lines of caste and religion and gender in terms of how do we how do men assert their identities on social media and that gives a lot of space to them to be able to do that. Uh, and uh, many different platforms like Snapchat uh, in terms of violence, yeah, so uh, violence was seen in two different ways. One was violence against women or gender-based violence where men are... Uh, this could do WhatsApp in two minutes. Yeah. So men uh, doing intimate uh, partner violence and marital violence and violence against women in public spaces and also violence amongst men themselves which was more along the lines of caste and religion and insights of schools and colleges, these become very primary sites of this kind of public violence amongst men. Uh, so just to uh, quickly go over certain gaps in programming that this research points at is that uh, there has been an approach of perpetrators and partners where men are either perpetrators of violence or partners in violence, but through an intersectional approach, uh, what this research is trying to build a case towards is to have a uh, uh, experiences of men, realities of young men, which go, uh, which definitely include gender identity, but also go beyond that and brings in the complex uh, spaces that men are navigating and then talk about uh, things like gender-based violence, things like consent, and uh, to, to build those reflective spaces, uh, it programming will have to account for that kind of experience also. Uh, so another case that this research builds is that then wherever we are building any kind of programming, we need to sort of uh, do specific research in those areas to find the dominant narratives of masculinity. One important gap in programming that we have seen is that the question of hegemonic masculinity is considered as one singular idea that affects all men equally. However, men from different caste backgrounds, different religion back religious background are probably 
and and evidently following different kinds of uh, dominant masculinities and norms of masculinities that we then need to navigate so therefore those conversations that we are holding with men of different identity positions need to account for that intersectionality to be to make this more relatable and to also ensure that men uh, find uh, reasons to stay with programming and find them reflective enough because one challenge is to ensure continued participation of men in different gbv and srh programs interest rate and uh, uh, people's interest and people's participation and and maintaining that has been a major challenge and uh, this research makes a case that that is possible i will just perhaps take 30 to 60 seconds more and finish up if that's okay uh Additionally, yes, uh, there is another important thing. But while we are building all these uh, tools and ways to talk about these things, it is also important that we build methodologies, uh, we build evaluation frameworks that also can account for and can can accommodate these methodologies in terms of our indicators of change, in terms of how we see behavioral change, and gender transform using gender transformative. uh just on the last note what we are now trying to do in the covid context is to sort of add to this research by speaking doing this research in the same uh geographical context and uh, reach out to organizations who work with men and boys on any of the issues of health like gender education gender sexuality and so on and uh, understand the impact of covid in uh, pandemic on the lives of young men as well as on the programming itself that they were already running so and that we are hoping that that research would give us insights into uh research would give us insights into uh understanding how uh interventions are being affected by the pandemic especially in the lockdown situation that happened in india and uh, what and to generally understand how crisis affects masculinities programming how crisis affects any engagement with young men and boys and therefore how we can mitigate that in the future because uh, while we are still actually emerging from the covid and covid uh, context uh, many realities of employment and livelihood and education of young men are also thrown into crisis in this context and a lot more anxieties in our initial scoping came out that might be affecting men's lives and therefore those might have to be accounted uh, when we build future programming around uh, gbv and srh with young men so keeping that in mind we are uh, designing the study and over the next couple of months we will be conducting this research uh, so i will end there uh, thank you so much and sorry about taking okay, thank you uh, thank you so much mr sagar uh, uh, i'm really sorry to rasia for such a very interesting study and then i hope we will have another time to discuss more uh and thank you again for you are calling for the development of robust and then context contextualized monitoring indicators which sounds very sensible thank you again and moving to the next agenda i would like to invite the next presenter dr ajay uh, who has uh, mphil and phd in demography for international institute of population sciences mumbai uh, he has more than 15 years of work experience on various issues leading international organizations on the range of issues related to gender based violence and getting men our rights and rights and hiv aids and matanga and time and many others he also contributed significantly to publishing in peer reviewed journals on the above topics currently he is working as senior expert at the un knowledge management for the us aids project on urban health and IPE Global in New Delhi, India. In the past, he has worked with the Population Council, International Center for Research on Women and Young Women. He will be presenting on the title of the Yes, Asserting Sexual and Reproductive Rights Prevents Married Women from the Right of Rape and Exploratory Study from India. The floor is yours, Dr. Ajay. Uh, thank you, Professor Sen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, can you also see my screen, please? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thanks, Ajay. Okay. So, good afternoon, all of you, and thanks for giving this me this opportunity to present my work here. Uh, and. Uh, 
So my, I will, I'm going to present on uh, reproductive and sexual rights of young married women, uh, which was a study, exploratory study, which was conducted in New Delhi. Uh, so the background of this study is basically, the, you know, there is a growing programmatic and research interest in addressing the sexual and reproductive rights uh, of the young in India, but uh, the thrust is uh, implicitly on unmarried uh, uh, young men or young men or women but uh, rather than on the uh, married. But the evidence is that the sexual activities among the young females in India takes place within the context of marriage. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and not only are the large proportion of young uh, sexually active within marital context, but also as is well known, married young are far more likely to experience regular sexual relationship and then are the unmarried sexually uh, active uh, young men, uh, young female. And we also know very little about, uh, uh, about the life of young married women and the literature is also very limited uh, on these uh, issues. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, I would just like to define what is a marital rape. Uh, so we see, uh, it has been taken from various literature. So marital rape is any unwanted sexual uh, Sexual acts by, uh, sorry, by spouse committed without consent or again a person. Can you just my this? Against a person will obtain by force or threat of force, uh, intimidation of when a person is unable to consent. And these sexual acts include intercourse, anal or oral sex, forced sexual behavior with other individuals. Other sexual activities that are considered by the victim as degrading, humiliating, painful, and unwanted. So this is uh, basically about the sexual uh, um, marital rape uh, uh, to define it. And this is how I have uh, organized my presentation. Uh, I will just talk a brief about the background and uh, objectives, sample and methods, and finally to findings uh, and closing it with a summary and conclusion. Uh, so, to, so the marital rape is, uh, as uh, many, many, many of the literature says that it's the most common and, uh, you know, quite prevalent form of masochism in Indian society. And it is hidden behind the curtain of marriage because it is understood that uh, the consent of uh, sex is presumed, uh, whether you do, uh, whether you force women for sex. Uh, so it is quite presumed that uh, whether women are or really ready for sex or not. Uh, one of the studies which was conducted by UNFPA uh, that uh, it found that two thirds of married women in India aged between 15 to 49 have been raped or forced to provide sex by the husband. Uh, and uh, as I said that in India, marital rape exists de facto, but not de jure. Uh, but in some other countries, either the legislature has criminalized marital rape or the judiciary has played an active role in recognizing it as an offense. And also in India, because of cultural norms, uh, the perceived social stigma attached to rape, often uh, women don't report such kind of uh, act by the husband uh, or take any kind of legal recourse. So the objective of this study is basically to explore the young married women uh, sexual and reproductive rights and the gender roles and its association with their experience of sexual and physical violence by their husband. Just to give you the background uh, of population sample and methods. So this study was exploratory study which was done in New Delhi with 650 young married women aged 15 to 29, so 29 years of age in a low income community uh, uh, so it was uh, the community was selected uh, very purposely uh, in one of the locality of Delhi. And then we did a house testing and a systematic random sampling was applied to select women. And it was basically a quantitative survey and using a, a handheld device. Uh, so the mean age of the women for my study was uh, 26 years and, uh, and they had around 10 years of schooling and um, and the mean age at marriage was quite young, 18 years of age. 
and uh, the household income was around 165 US dollar. And only 11% of the women which uh, uh, sampled women were working for money. And uh, as the women were quite young, so the mean matter duration was around five years. Uh, uh, for this study, I have uh, created uh, four index uh, to, you know, to build association and build a case. Uh, so uh, the first one is empowerment index, uh, which takes into account the women's freedom for spending money for buying goods of her choice, freedom of mobility, or freedom of spending money, or uh, you know, free freedom to seek healthcare, healthcare services, or freedom to making decisions to limit the family size. And likewise for sexual right index, uh, I have taken uh, uh, the tire, whether she's tired or not in mood to have sex and have recently given a birth uh, and, uh, and uh, whether she can refuse sex when husband has a sex with other women or whether she can refuse sex when she knows that husband has sexually transmitted disease. Uh, likewise for reproductive right, I have taken uh, whether she could decide upon the number of children that she can have or whether she can decide upon the spacing of the children, or whether they can decide about the type of family planning method, which will best suit her, and whether she's capable of spending money on her health needs without husband consent, and, uh, and whether it is her right to keep a pregnancy or abort it. And uh, I've also created a compatibility index, uh, whether or not uh, women, uh, talks with her husband or reproductive, reproductive health, family planning, HIV, etc. And uh, have a, whether she had been ever been out with, their, with her husband for recreational uh, things. Uh, and whether she have been, uh, uh, she ever quarreled with her husband, there's a restrictive attitude of husband. Uh, and there's a communication about uh, using a contraceptive uh, and so on. Uh, Ajay, can I interrupt for a moment? Our yeah. sign language interpreter has requested that could you please speak uh, a little louder? Okay, sure. Thank, thank you. Sure. Can you hear? This is okay. Okay. Uh, going going to the results. Uh, so uh, on the perception or reproductive sexual rights, uh, there are four, uh, five, uh, four or five statements in each of the category. So looking at the reproductive rights, uh, the first statement which is, uh, talks about whether you should decide upon the number of children that you will have, around 69% uh, of women agree that they should be in the position of deciding that. And uh, whether she should uh, decide upon the spacing of children, around 78% of women said yes. And likewise, uh, about the decision uh, about the family planning methods, around 62% of women said they should be doing that. And uh, and this should be they should be the alone capable of deciding upon the spending money on her health need without husband consent. Around sixty eight percent of women said yes. And uh, uh, for refusing sex, uh, uh, whether we women is justified in refusing sex with her husband, or uh, when she's not tired or not in a mood, around thirty nine percent said uh, they said they do not agree basically. Uh, and then she has recently given birth to around again 39% sex. Uh, and when she knows that her husband have sex with other women, and 40% uh, they don't agree that they should be refusing uh, or justifying in refusing sex with her husband. And she knows that her husband has a sexually transmitted disease. Again, around 41% of women say so. Uh, so there's a lifetime experience of sexual and physical violence. So, so if you look at uh, any kind of violence, around 78% of women say that they have experienced any kind of violence from their husband. And uh, then 62% uh, of physical violence, uh, sexual violence and uh, physical violence constituted around 45%. And uh, physical and sexual violence is around 41% of uh, a specific uh, sexual and physical violence, if you look at it, uh, 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 so did he ever force her to do something sexual that she found degrading or humiliating? Around 52% of women said so. And did she ever have sexual intercourse when she did not want because she was afraid of what he might do? Around 42% and physically forced to have sexual intercourse when she did not want to? Around 38% of women said so. 
And uh, all the three kinds of sexual violence, uh, uh, around 24% of women said they, they experienced all these three kinds of uh, uh, sexual violence from her husband. And likewise for physical and non-physical violence also, there's specific uh, uh, you know, categories uh, like uh, whether she was threatened with, her, uh, with gun or weapon, choked her or burned her, kicked or dragged her. So all these, so the prevalence overall for each specific categories are not so, but if you collate or combine them together, it's close to around two fifths of women uh, who say they have been, they have experienced physical violence. Although the non-physical violence constitute uh, a bigger proportion. Uh, and I've also looked at the frequency of sexual and physical violence during the last 12 months. Uh, and it shows that around 40% of women more than 40% of women uh, had uh, experienced sexual violence uh, more than once in the last 12 months. Likewise, uh, around 35% of women uh, have experienced uh, more than once physical violence from their husband. Uh, so I've also looked at uh, uh, whether this woman, uh, uh, those have experienced a different kind of violence, whether they justify uh, uh, why beating in different scenarios, like uh, if you look at physical violence, the women who have experienced physical violence, uh, uh, whether we, she justifies uh, uh, wife beating when she goes out without telling him, and if she neglects uh, the children, if she argues with him, if she refuses to have sex with him, if she burns the food. So in all this category, we find that women who have experienced uh, physical violence, a more proportion of them uh, seems to be justifying uh, violence, wife beating under all these categories. Likewise, the similar pattern has, uh, you can see among the women who have experienced sexual violence and uh, versus those who, have don't, those who have not experienced any sexual violence. Uh, so so what, is, what is the next reaction of a husband when women refuses to do sex? So we found that uh, around 35% uh, uh, of women uh, uh, said that uh, they experienced physical violence from her husband. So basically, uh, around they, uh, her husband beat her uh, because she refused for, uh, uh, for sex. And, uh, uh, and around 26% again, they for, uh, she black, he blackmailed her to, for sex, like she will go to other women or she will leave her, or he will leave her and so forth. Uh, we also looked at the uh, risk perception of women who experience violence and we found that the risk perception was very high among women uh, who experience either sexual or physical violence and the uh, perception, risk perception was measured through two indicators whether, whether she feels that husband has an extramarital sex or she is worried, worried that she can be infected uh, with HIV. So we see that a high proportion of women who experience violence uh, had a higher risk perception. Dr. Ajay, please go to the back in two minutes. Sure. Uh, likewise, the, uh, you know, the symptoms of RTI or STI uh, symptoms was also high, uh, pro proportionately high in uh, women uh, who experienced uh, sexual violence. Uh, and also the women who experienced sexual or physical violence, they also reported to have more menstruation related problems. Uh, and also, uh, we found that uh, women who experience violence, they are less likely to, you know, discuss about family planning and other health issues with the husband. Uh, and we also do a cross tabulation uh, with uh, all those indexes, empowerment index, right index. We found that uh, uh, although the because the incident uh, prevalence of violence was very high, but we found that uh, women who had scored higher on empowerment index or a productive right index, they reported tend to report less uh, of violence, any form of violence. And uh, when uh, we did uh, two models of uh, multivariate uh, regression analysis, and we found that uh, 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 we found that uh, in the first model, the sexual violence is taken as a dependent variable. And uh, we found that uh, 
uh, uh, reproductive uh, women who score higher on the reproductive right scale, uh, they are less likely to report sexual violence. Although the prevalence, uh, although the uh, significance level is very, uh, you know, marginal. Uh, I mean, the, although it is significant, but uh, uh, and uh, when we look at the sexual right scale, all, uh, we find that uh, women who tend to, you know, assert uh, more on sexual right. Uh, they also reported higher on you know, marginally higher uh, reporting about uh, experience of sexual violence. And uh, similarly for STD as well, uh, we found that uh, any form of violence uh, we maintained to, uh, they had higher likelihood of reporting of STDs. Uh, so in summary, uh, so women, despite asserting their sexual rights and reproductive rights, a considerable number of them are battered and sexually coerced by the husband. And it is disheartening to see that women who experience violence, more of them also justify violence. And, uh, and those who, are, who have experienced sexual and other forms of violence, a significant number of them had high risk of sexual violence. And, and women, uh, because of social and familial taboo, attest to report marital rape. Uh, it restricts women to take legal discourse and forces women to suffer alone and makes them vulnerable to serious health problems, including STD and HIV. Uh, the last slide. Uh, and also because the, as far as research goes, there's a dearth of data on this issue and, uh, and we should advocate more research on incidents, forms and context of sexual coercion among married young women in a different setting. And one of the, as one of the presenters also said that uh, we should involve men and uh, yeah, uh, men and uh, to become more gender equitable. So we should in include more and more men into, you know, gender -based violence discourse. And also the uh, marital rape should be recognized by parliament as an often offense under Indian Penal Code. And we should also build capacity of local support structure uh, within at the different levels, like at the panchayat level, at the village level. So that women should, uh, you know, uh, who suffer, should, they should be able to access uh, to any kind of legal support which they might uh, want uh, within, within their reach. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ajay, for your study information on SRHR. And most importantly, uh, you have pointed out the need of uh, male involvement to become more gender equal. So I totally support that, that point. It also has uh, highlighted the legal recognition by the parliament um, as an offense. And it, that is very important. Again, there is an urgent call for the capacity building of the support structures to be able to help the victim to legal discourse of their choice with the sensitivity. Thank you again, Dr. Ajay. And last but not the least, I have my pleasure to invite Ms. Puspa, who is a national coordinator uh, at the Indonesia Coalition for Sexual and Diversity. She is responsible uh, for the, the planning, monitoring and evaluation of the whole program at the ASK program in ARI. So please join me to listen to the voices of the front line by Ms. Puspa. Over to you, Puspa. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, distinguished guests and presenters, my name is Puspa Dewi. I'm the National Coordinator for Kita Sama, a youth network which focuses on sexuality and diversity in Indonesia. Thank you for inviting me and for allowing me to talk about the interlinkage of sexual and gender-based violence and sexual reproductive health and rights in our region. As a young woman who is part of the 49% of women and girls who have undergone uh, female genital mutilation or cutting, or we know as FGMC in Indonesia, I don't want other young people uh, or young other women to experience the same thing. All forms of FGMC are a violation of the human rights of women and girls and can lead to a range of physical and psychological consequences. At least 4.1 million girls are being cut globally each year, which will rise to 4.6 million girls by 2030 due to population growth. Over a million of these girls will be in Asia. I'm making this intervention on behalf of Asia Network to NFGMC, a network co-facilitated by Aero and Orchard Project. 
The Asian Network aims to build collaboration and support between groups already working to end FGMC in our region. I would like to present the following recommendations. Firstly, take concrete steps to implement the recommendation of the CDO and CRC which relate to prevention of FGMC where applicable, including providing country level data in relation to SDGs indicator 5.3.2, which is proportion of girls and women aged 15 until 49 years who have undergone FGMC by age. Secondly, a fully funded national action plan to end FGMC is urgently required that prioritizes community-based programming and a multi-sectoral approach to end the practice, including programming that is non-judgmental, right-based, and addresses harmful social and gender norms. Thirdly, consult and engage religious leaders, schoolers, and institutions to issue rulings or fatwa Again, all forms of the practice and support and fun awareness, also education campaigns. Fourthly, and the most important aspect is engage and empower young people to prevent FGMC as they play a crucial role in ending the harmful practice of FGMC. And I think meaningful engagement on program and campaign development is the key. I may be young, but I have experienced it myself. Ending FGMC is a battle we can win. It can end with us. Let's work and in hand to accelerate action to end FGMC across Asia. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Puspa, for your uh, very short and sweet and important message and a very sensible recommendations. Now, the it is the time to conclude our uh, the presentation session. And then I will cut, cut short my the conclusion remarks uh, as quick as possible. The, first of all, I would like to congratulate the plenary speaker, Mr. Jata, and all presenters and Ms. Kuspas. All of your informations are very commendable and useful for the future policy development. Today, we have been reminded of what many women suffer throughout our lives and of the terrible consequences uh, this has for them and their children. Let us remember what we have learned today and to mainstream into our every initiative in our lives as much as possible. All women and all girls deserve a life free from violence, including us. As all, we all are here now, I believe we are ready to be strong implementers of the Agenda 2030 that give us only a decade before its end date, by which time we should have reached a substantive equality. We have to remember that gender inequality is not an open-ended journey that we have to walk until our next generation, but this is the journey that has a target year 2030. Uh, and the, one of them is the, uh, you know, the most important gender inequality and women's empowerment as the members of the UN has addressed. Uh, as a number of the challenges of the 21st century. And violence against women continues to be an obstacle to achieving equality, development, peace, as well as the fulfillment of the many uh, chapters of women and girls' uh, human rights. In 2030, we will want to make sure that equality is applied everywhere as a norm. We trust ourselves and then trust you all, especially the mid-level leaders in this field, like our speakers and their leader like Puspa, you all are little red agents that can. And then no doubt you will leave the gender equality as an legacy to our next and next generations. And uh, finally, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Mordrecha, our post audiences, and then uh, great thanks to the convener, uh, Dr. Chiwon, and your very able team. So with that, I would like to conclude the sessions of the presentation. And then thank you everyone once again. And then now the session is over to you, Shuba. And my apology if we have overshoot sometimes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. You've done it so well, managed the time so well by yourself. Thank you very much. And we now have the open session. Uh, participants, please type in your questions or comments in the chat box and those watching on Facebook can type in the comment box. We already have lots many questions and I will try to take up as many as possible. And if any remain, then uh, 
you can contact uh, the presenter directly. Uh, there is a question from Nina Rachman, a Secretary of Population Control and Family Planning Department, Indonesia. And Nina wants to know what has been the impact of COVID-19 on the problem of violence against women and children, and as well as reproductive health services in different countries. And uh, uh, Kalpana Acharya, a very senior journalist from Nepal, who heads the uh, Health Journalists Association of Nepal, also has a similar question that what about gender-based violence in the times of COVID-19? Uh, Sujata, would you like to take up uh, that? And uh, other uh, uh, presenters can also answer it. Yes. Thank you so much, Shoga. Um, I think it's really hard to say in statistical terms what the difference has been or what the impact has been on GBV. Because like I said earlier, we have discouraged any kind of prevalence surveys to be undertaken during COVID because it's very hard to do so without compromising the safety uh, of women. Um, and so at the moment, what we are going by are information that has been collected through service providers, right? So like hotlines, police, health services, et cetera, which we know very well that they are, they basically represent a tip of the iceberg. So we do not at the moment, at least from where I sit, have the information to show statistically that this has been the increase or decrease on GBV prevalence. What we have seen is that the intake or uptake rather of services has increased. It has put a lot of pressure for the service providers to adapt and change the modality in which they have to provide services. We've seen that across the region and that was some of the promising factors that I shared earlier. Um, and we definitely feel like the investment in terms of uh, supporting the services um, needs to be really, really, uh, you know, upscaled. So I would stop there, uh, Shoba. I think because, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Anybody else would like to respond to that? Uh, any of the other presenters? Uh, okay, we move on to the next question. Uh, this is a question from Artemis Arujado, who is HIV counselor uh, and a student from Philippines. Uh, uh, Artemis wants to know during the time of the pandemic, what are the best ways or approaches for an individual to cope with gender-based violence, knowing that there are governments who ignore addressing these issues locally. And maybe this may be different for different countries. So uh, I would like everyone to share their own example. In your country context, what is the way to cope with gender-based violence? Mela, would you like to begin? Okay, uh, let me try. Yes, please. So uh, it, it's really a, a challenging question because um, like in Indonesian case, uh, we are so diverse. So uh, we have so many different cultures, different uh, beliefs, but on, on, on GBV, um, uh, unfortunately, that um, um, many communities are still uh, 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 don't see uh, GBV as a as a, as a problem, mm -hmm. and many of uh, even the women uh, um, many has um, perceived that some practices are uh, are um, acceptable. So um, one of the, the intervention that we tried is to, uh, that uh, we, we also see some good, uh, good uh, development is to um, create awareness of what, what is GBV. So people aware more on, uh, uh, on uh, whether this is uh, considered as harmful or not harmful because uh, before that, for example, uh, uh, a wife uh, being beaten by a husband because of uh, because he, he left house without permission, for example, mm -hmm. it's acceptable for some uh, some uh, community. Which then we try to to um, create the awareness that uh, for any reason there is not acceptable for a husband to beat uh, the wife, and. Um, uh, also in Indonesia, we have already um, uh, a law uh, for uh, prevention and management of uh, gender-based violence, but we still need to um, 
sensitize um, many, uh, not only the community, but uh, even the the uh, stakeholders or decision makers to be aware of this uh, of the law, the existing law. So I think I will stop there and uh, give others a chance to sh also share. Thank you, Shoba. Yes, thank you. You have summed it up very well. I think the situation would be more or less the same in other countries as well. Um, so I think that has been a very good summing up of how to respond uh, in that context. Uh, Sujata, would you like to add something there? No, I think Mela has uh, yeah, very yes. adequately covered it. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Ashok Kumar Pathak from India Health Action Trust. And Ashok says this session has been a great opportunity of learning. And what has been the impact of gender-based violence on nutritional status of newborns and pregnant women? Is there any proof of concept that engaging men in nutrition and health reduces gender-based violence? Uh, would any of the panelists like to take up that? Or how is gender-based violence related to or impacting nutritional status of women and newborns? Sujata, we would like to hear from you on that. Thank you, Shoba. I mean, I, again, this is not an area where I have a lot of uh, statistical information. What we are seeing, as I said earlier, is that, you know, a lot of the um, gender inequalities are getting deepened and entrenched. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if there are any, in, if any kind of sort of gender related inequalities and discrimination around nutritional issues, we could only imagine that they have also trans transpired in that area. Um, but yeah, given it's such a specific question, I think this is something that I've noted down to look for more information. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to share my, my e uh, email address for any further conversation on that. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, I think this is important and may maybe you come across some startling results or uh, some, some new data. Uh, we have a very good question from Pandu Halonga Wanjik. Uh, Pandu says, most of our programs are failing to address structural issues and the root causes of gender-based violence. For example, issues of parenting, issues of love, importance of human humanity, and the result is that the vulnerable go back to the same structures that made them vulnerable. So, Sujata, would you like to take on to that? <laughs> yes, sorry. But... <laughs> You are representing our region. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a huge responsibility to yes. carry. Yes. Um, but I think this question really highlights some of the points that I wanted to, I was trying to make in my presentation is that really the investment in prevention and social norm change needs to continue and needs to evolve in the current context of COVID. Um, I think in our region, we see quite a bit of, um, uh, you know, experimentation that has happened in this area. So whether it's through parenting programs or life skill programs, comprehensive sexuality education, which tries to address, uh, you know, sort of uh, young girls and boys uh, gender norm formation stage. So we can introduce the ideas of healthy relationship, you know, gender power equality, um, uh, concepts that would help them understand what is harmful and what is more equal gender norms. However, this is an area where we while we do have global frameworks that are very useful, and I'd love to bring forward um, this uh, example of a RESPECT framework. I don't know if colleagues have heard of this. It's a joint framework, it's a uh, global framework on, on violence prevention that has recently been introduced. I'm happy to share the link in the chat, which really builds on the global evidence base of what works to prevent violence. Um, and it brings about various interventions that have been tried and tested and evaluated. Um, but in terms of contextualizing to COVID, I think that's still a lot of work yet to be done. So I'll stop there, Shobha, and I'll share the link on the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Tainten, would you like, we would like to hear you on this issue, how to tackle the root causes of uh, gender-based violence. So that, uh, as the, the question says, that the vulnerable do not go back to the same situation and same structure. Yeah, that is very good questions indeed. But uh, the, we don't have uh, uh, one solution that fits all. 
So it needs it based upon the not only from the now we are talking a lot on the socioeconomic background, but the problems can come up from any any level of socioeconomic background. And then so this is the multifactorial. And then but uh, the JBV when we are trying to uh, the, the develop some sort of the very effective intervention and then some of our speakers uh, pointed out on the male environment that is very important now that we cannot just uh, solely uh, you know the, the, the locate into our the women's and girls but once we want to empower the women and then we need to empower men and then for the gender equality also we also need to work uh, hand in hand with the, the men's uh, group and then they have they also have their own problem and then so we can meet two ends in the middle thank you uh, we have a question from hen menton uh, who says that with uh, the technology and lockdown going hand in hand use of video chatting for pleasure and recording results has resulted or results in blackmailing and violence is occurring amongst the youth so is there any guideline or process to tackle such types of what we can call on online uh, violence and how can we educate uh, uh, people or school or in school children about such such problems so so that they do not occur in future yes professor can you uh, respond to that yes sorry me? Uh, yeah, I saw that uh, kind of uh, information on the such initiative uh, in the Sujata's presentation. Mm -hmm. I very, very much, but this is the, especially the countries uh, like, like us, uh, we use that as social media and then we came in late uh, to use such kind of things. And then so many of the users, uh, we are quite ignorant about uh, what could be the consequences of that uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, the taking advantage of or chatting uh, on the social media and then some keep uh, the files with the sunlight photos and then blackmailing or something like that. So this is the, uh, the, the, the media uh, information and then initiative uh, in the region is, uh, I thank you Sujata and that you can add on more because uh, you have that uh, very advanced sort of uh, information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, Vanna, so Vanna, yes, can, yes. I, can I jump in on yeah, this? Yeah, please. Yes, uh, please. I was going to come to you anyway, so please do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Just to add uh, to this, the, this discussion, it's, it's really, um, uh, how should I say, uh, the, uh, the root uh, uh, the main question on, on how to address the root cause of this uh, gender-based violence. I think all of us are, are struggling to to really uh, address the root uh, cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, to share with you our um, initiative here is uh, one is to try um, um, working with the young people. So we try to, to uh, have a structured... Um, it's not a life skill course, but uh, more on um, it's uh, we managed to we, we were able to work with the Ministry of Education to include um, these uh, gender norms um, uh, topics uh, in in uh, one of the as one of the uh, sexual and reproductive health uh, education. It's uh, but but our challenge would be that uh, that we anticipate now is how uh, we measure the, the the impact of this. Of course, in the theory of change, we can show uh, and you know the, the the chain of the education towards the the young people on how to change the gender norms, how to have a, uh, to have a better uh, uh, understanding or a conception on a healthy relationship. But how uh, at the end we can uh, measure this? Uh, so this is uh, uh, one challenge we, uh, we are facing now. And um, the, the other intervention that um, we are uh, working on is on male involvement. So um, there are more and more uh, initiative uh, from male groups that, are, that have more um, 
uh, interest to work together to to fight uh, gender-based violence. But uh, what we also see, um, there are some um, male involvement initiative that also we have to also be careful because some of the initiative will without their without their um, intention it's um, the intention is to protect the the woman but you know uh, at the end it's it's limits the woman's um, uh, uh, limits the woman's activity or or uh, work or so with male involvement although by concept i think we have to uh, we have to do that as one of the initiative but we have to also be careful uh, as not to put the male involvement as um, as an area for male to dom to even uh, get more uh, dom dominate dominate the the women right. thank you so much thank you Yes, thank you. Can I yes, 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 please do. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I completely echo the point made by Mela that we do need to uh, build male involvement in a way that is more allyship based and not taking up space and leadership in their own way. Uh, and there is a risk of that happening always. So programming does need to account for that. But just adding one more point on the root causes of gender based violence. I think one important thing, and this became very popular uh, in in the Indian, Northern Indian context recently in a case, but it's a very old conversation on understanding gender-based violence and its root causes is important, but also understanding what are the other root causes that are coupled with the gender identity. So uh, recently, one of the many, many cases against a Dalit women, a rape case against a Dalit woman became very popular. And there were again, those cries for justice and a lot of uh, conflict happened between the state and the civil society organizations and the people. Uh, what was one thing that stood out was even amongst the people who were uh, really raising their voices for justice and supporting the survivor, um, uh, was that uh, the family of the victim was that uh, there was an attempt to downplay the caste uh, identity in all of that. So uh, this was a, this was a Dalit girl from a lower caste community. Uh, and, the, and, and the root cause of such violence was uh, highlighted to be gender-based violence, but a lot of groups were trying to downplay the caste, which was also a root cause of that violence, right? So uh, in understanding gender-based violence, uh, one thing that I feel needs to be kept in mind is that we have to understand that identities don't work isolated and we need to build an intersectional way in which we understand GBV and that would help us probably build uh, interventions and programs of prevention that would address those realities of people much in much more detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, can, I, can, I, yes. yeah, can I comment on that? Yes, so I was coming to you. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 Professor Chia. Uh, just to let you know, in terms of uh, the idea of uh, response to the GBV, so uh, Kana is the the large organization. We are now uh, uh, receiving the uh, support from the World Bank to design the 24 hours uh, uh, chat lines. Uh, we use WhatsApp, and now currently is the the design stage. We are working on the development of the intervention packages. And we hope to address the uh, exploiting the GBV, as you can see from my presentation. So we will address that uh, uh, GBV survivor, and then uh, that's going to be 24 hour uh, chat lines, uh, including GBVs and emotional support as well. So, uh, too early to say the result, but because of the, the, the state of designing of the intervention package, and we're going to have 20. 36, uh, yeah, three, three years, uh, uh, two, one, one year, a uh, two year in the and uh, the last year, the six month of last year, and the first, the, the first six month of first year for the design and the evaluation. So we hope to share uh, the, the result during the next uh, uh, conference, the, the ELO Energy Basic Conference. So just to let you know, so the intervention cannot be, you know, address all the, especially the younger age. Uh, uh, of uh, female internal uh, workers and including the the uh, their uh, partner as well. So hope to, to see that. Thank, okay. thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. And so Vanari, we have a question for you. The, okay, please. That, uh, your study shows high emotional abuse in the female entertainment workers in Cambodia, but yeah. uh, this is happening elsewhere also. Uh, perhaps <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's quite a universal phenomenon. 
uh, but mm -hmm. not very often documented and perhaps also very difficult to document and even in some other studies i think in study uh, uh, presentation of ajay uh, he has spoken of non physical violence so non physical violence is again difficult to uh, document so what needs to be done although the, this is uh, it's it's a very brutal and cruel form of violence but uh, very often goes unnoticed so what according to you is the way out um i think the because the, the intervention uh, the 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 package of events and we do have like a very uh, friendly uh, what we call friendly uh, species for the uh, uh, female tetrapoda so that's why the design of the uh, intervention they also include uh, uh, gbv and the uh, sexual and emotional physical abuse as part of the intervention as you may know our program not uh, vertically for gbv uh, as or age and family planning but we are hiv prevention so the gbv as or age and uh, family planning are part of the integrated uh, services so uh, the everyone at the community they are you know linkage to the idea of we got is about uh, uh, we use the peer uh, that data collector to uh, to 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 collect the, the data and everything them. We use the former, we use the outreach worker who are currently also working as uh, at the establishment uh, uh, venue to support and collect the data. So that's why you can see the data, you know, disclose our emotional, physical, and the foster as well. So that's why uh, uh, including the force uh, substance use as well. It's somehow the in other countries, uh, the substance use or physical or emotional burst. Uh, uh, limited in terms of uh, uh, said reported. I think that uh, the idea and the data from our uh, study was from the randomized control trial. So they are all registered into the system, the registration, uh, the register uh, intervention package. So we are closely monitored and they, you know, they are willing to support us on that part. So we can got this information. So I will. Uh, I can I can share the uh, uh, full papers from the application as well if everyone interested. So I will also. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, would the other panelists like to say uh, something about or share their views on this? What we call emotional violence and non-physical violence. That's a, I think that's a very important uh, point. Which as we, uh, some the questioner has said that it is often neglected. Okay. Would somebody else like to comment also on it? Mela, would you like to comment? Mela has to leave for another meeting. So, Mela, would you like to comment before you leave? So, but I, I, I heard you call me. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, my, 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 my network is not yes, yes. Not about, so good. It's on and off. About non-physical violence and emotional violence. So, uh, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. Can we? Okay, I think there is some problem there. I hope I am audible to the others. Okay, we can. We'll go to Mela later on. I think she cannot hear us. Uh, we have a question from Yasoda Kura uh, on Facebook, uh, from on the Facebook comment box that many of the gender inequalities exist even from antenatal period to adolescence. Has any study being done or any evaluation being done for that period of age? Sujata, we are coming back to you again on this. I would love to hear from other panelists on this first piece. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Sagar, Ajay. Yeah, so uh, Ajay here. Uh, yeah. So yes, I think uh, I'm not aware about many of the studies which have been done to look at uh, antenatal or prenatal uh, violence. But uh, the anecdotal evidences which are available shows that women experience more violence uh, uh, during pregnancy. And, uh, and many of the time it is a sexual violence. And also they face kind of uh, non-physical violence. So uh, in terms like if they don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, they don't uh, uh, do sex uh, during, uh, they will go to other women and that sort of, uh, you know, uh, pressure is uh, created, to, you know, to uh, intimidate women during pregnancy and post-pregnancy. 
but uh, coming to uh, some other comment which we also discussed about how to you know uh, review gender based violence uh, many of the studies which have been done uh, taking into account the ecological model and we have seen that uh, uh, many of the organization who works uh, with the community uh, which targets not only women but also the you know, key decision maker in the family and they also take into account the community members and the young men basically the you know youth organization and they created a model wherein they can come whenever there is a kind of a uh, village meeting they will raise the issue of gender based violence in the community so that they will make uh, the community more aware about uh, this kind of issues which can and more and more women can be uh, will be able to access uh, the legal uh, legal discourse oh yes and also uh, my, my study and many of other study also found that uh, the women who are who are more empowered uh, those who are more uh, uh, educated or uh, they are uh, into jobs uh, they face less violence i think more and more uh, uh, efforts should be made uh, to make them more empowered that uh, they should remain more in the school and also the age at marriage also can be advanced uh, through our you know multiple uh, efforts all right Th thank you very much uh, we have a question uh, from uh, j if uh, if sujata is still there uh, j saying wants to know what are some examples of emerging and new forms of violence uh, sujata if you are there if you could just answer this and then perhaps okay. but i already responded to that in the no, chat no we want we want to listen to it because this is being recorded those who are on facebook have not ah, heard your right answer right. Yes. Okay, no problem. Yes. Yeah, no, I was just giving some examples in the chats yes. that uh, some of the new forms of violence that we are seeing are sort of online violence, you know, technology in induced violence, uh, mm -hmm. harassment, but also, you know, uh, beyond that, also, you know, increased levels of produ reproductive coercion and some of the other panelists have spoken very, very in depth about these. And these are the areas I just brought it up because I feel our traditional sort of formats of uh, research don't always take into account uh, these new and emerging forms of violence, which are also very context specific. So I hope that responds to yeah. Jay's question, but I also encourage everybody who's interested in this area to continue to include that lens as you go forward in, you know, uh, uh, more research in this area. Thank you, Shobhan. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Sagar, we have a question for you. You may have answered it partly, but uh, it is directed to you that a very interesting presentation rooted to ground realities in India. And patriarchy and caste abets assertion of power, as you mentioned just now. Boys are brought up with false and stereotyped notions of masculinity. And uh, they are taught from the very childhood not to take no for an answer. So what is the way forward for this? What is the uh, means and how to target boys? And it has been said earlier also uh, that uh, it is not about protecting girls. And I think that is a total misnomer. It is protecting who from whom. I think everybody needs a space, safe space and human, humane space to live in. So uh, what would you, uh, what would be your response to that, Sagar? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's a lot to be said, so I'll keep it brief. Um, so, uh, I think while understanding all this socialization, what's important is to now create spaces which are not telling men what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. Because a lot of times when we try to have conversations on masculinities, saying uh, this is consent, this is what respect for women looks like, so th these are the things you need to do. This kind of intervention doesn't take us very far because uh, engaging participants in ways uh, that speaks to their realities, that speaks to the logic, uh, the, that the rationalizations of practices uh, through their experience that they have learned is something we need to build. So uh, what, what I would recommend and what we're trying to actually build at TYPF is uh, spaces for reflections on understanding uh, if, if men have access to spaces where they can just reflect on how their realities have been affecting their relationships with everybody else around them. Uh, the kind of violence that exists already why does that exist? Understanding roots of that violence would help in taking this further because uh, it's it's a it's a very uh, 
complicated uh, play of how there are many privileges and entitlements that men enjoy because of patriarchy as well as a lot of uh, pressures of performance of masculinity that they themselves face so while uh, men are quick to uh, recognize these pressures it is by taking this conversations towards those entitlements as well and keeping these pressures in hand at the same time is when this kind of reflection can happen so uh, in 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 so so an inroads in my experience has been to uh, whenever i have held conversations with young men on these issues uh, my uh, beginning point isn't to tell everybody that you know uh, stop being violent this is what respect is this is what you need to do to be a, a better man or a real man what an inter- what a would a good way to start this conversation is to first talk about what is it that uh, men are feeling anxious about what is it that their worries are and then take the conversation towards understanding gender towards understanding power what kind of power position they may be enjoying and then uh, sort of unpack many more things around patriarchy and masculinity so it's just about how we approach this conversation and how uh, participant centered we make this to be in terms of life experiences okay thank you and the uh, uh, audience i'm sorry i'm we are overshooting the time but the conversation and discussion is so interesting that please bear with me for a little more while and uh, sagar there was a question for you from rashmi that is the rising religious fundamentalism in the cities where the study was done uh, has that been impacting srhr and gender based violence uh, yeah actually uh, so there is a massive rise in fundamentalism in the last few years especially uh, in in uttar pradesh and many of the cities there so yes uh, there have been there has been increased violence along religious lines there has been increased violence against the muslim minority communities uh, and in terms of srhr i feel that uh, just in terms of uh, how how the law has been affecting uh, uh sexualities is, is that uh, in india we see a pattern of the law criminalizing young people's sexuality through different laws like uh uh like pocso act in 2012 and uh, now recently a new law has come which 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 uh, seems to on the face of it regulate interfaith marriages but what the criticism of that law has been that it's basically uh trying to stop interfaith marriages because on based on this very false premise that uh, muslim men are trying to marry hindu women and convert them to islam which is uh, which is again this fundamentalist agenda of many groups and agencies so uh, this kind of uh, fundamentalism has also now is now also getting legally codified further and therefore is having serious impacts in the sense how identities are playing out and uh, religious and religion and nationalism and my presentation also what i talked about is actually becoming a more serious concern in context of gender based violence in context of masculinities also thank you uh, we have dr neelam singh from vatsalya who is in the audience and uh, dr singh would you like to make a comment dr neelam singh if she is there okay maybe there maybe there are internet issues with her so uh, we have uh, a question for ajay and rather some comments also uh, we have a question from sapna majumdar a very senior journalist from india that uh, how did you reach out to the women on this sensitive issue did you collaborate with a local ngo and what was the period of the study ajay Yes, I did answer in the chat, but I will just uh, repeat yes, it. Yes, please. Yes. So uh, the study, uh, yes, uh, we I didn't interact with men directly. Uh, I had to hire some, uh, you know, uh, female investigators, a researcher for collecting data. And uh, the site of uh, the interview was selected, uh, looking at some uh, demographic indicators uh, from census and other sources. And uh, yes, the women were selected randomly, as I said. Uh, but we are collected through uh, female researcher the period of the study was between uh, january 2016 to uh, uh, may 2016 uh, this was the duration of the study okay. and uh, you, did you collaborate with any other were there any other agencies collaborating with it or it was an no, no. this was my own exploratory study as part okay. of okay 
Okay. So I didn't have, Thank you. But I did have take took help from them uh, for, uh, to reaching out to this community. Sonal Mehta from UNFPA. She says, I'm a bit concerned that there is so much of your emphasis on low socioeconomic background. I'm sure we will have similar feedback from most backgrounds. And uh, there is another similar comment that I echo what Sonal has said. Gender-based inequalities and stereotypes run deeper in all across all socioeconomic spectrum. Yes, definitely. Uh, definitely uh, I agree with that. And, uh, but uh, looking at the community which I uh, did the study, they were from the low socioeconomic group. And also the age at marriage within that uh, socioeconomic group is lower than uh, you know some other group. And we, uh, uh, the whole hypothesis of this study was also to look at uh, whether women who are married early, uh, they uh, tend to, you know, uh, they generally don't uh, uh, exercise their reproductive rights or sexual rights, or they are not able to exercise those rights. And uh, uh, that was the whole notion of this study. And, uh, and I, I, I agree that in uh, other setting also, a similar kind of uh, issues might be there. Uh, but uh, my understanding is in this uh, low socioeconomic uh, setup, uh, these are more prevalent. Okay, thank you. And my ab apologies, I want to make a correction. I think it was a slip of the tongue. I said Sonal Mehta is, in, is from UNFPA. No, Sonal is heading the IPPF South Asia office. So sorry for that, Sonal. Uh, and sorry to others also. Uh, Dr. Neelam Singh is there. Dr. Neelam Singh, would you like to make a quick intervention? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, the studies on uh, antenatal violence against women and uh, their outcomes on the perinatal outcomes means on the uh, child as well as on the mother is very well documented. I do not have ready reference to just uh, speak about it, but there are many international studies and even one study in India which is existing, which I have read of. I think it is something very serious. In fact, the frontline workers are also taught how to identify uh, the violence on a pregnant woman. Uh, there are some indications and markers and some indication which can make it uh, very, very uh, obvious. So uh, I would not be able to uh, right now give the ready reference, but it's very, very common. There are uh, reasons which one of the participants uh, spoke of. There are reasons also why women face a lot of violence. Uh, physical as well as uh, physical and mental violence during pregnancy. There are reasons. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So can you uh, share your email ID on the chat box for everyone to see and then we can they can connect with you. Just chat. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I have already shared okay. my okay. Uh, I have shared it. my email okay. ID. Okay. I have already shared my email ID. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, my apologies for overshooting the time. And now we come to the close of the 13th session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. My sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speaker, abstract presenters, and to the participants. Special thanks to Lucy Lim and John Baliza for their sign language interpretation. Also, special thanks to UNFPA and IPPF for their continuous support and help to APCR SHR 10 virtual. We will now meet on Monday, December 21 at 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the final 14th APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of sexual orientation and gender identity and SRHR in Asia Pacific. Bye till then, stay safe, stay healthy and hope to see you again on December 21. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.